Thank you, Francisco. And um, we're now going to move into uh, a discussion of all of these wonderful papers. Um, and uh, I will invite the speakers up in a few minutes to come sit um, and, and start answering questions. But I wanted to highlight some of the themes that, that have struck me so far today. Um, one of them is the idea of continuity. I feel like it's come up in every paper, the ways in which people who seek authority connect themselves to their, um, either their ancestors, the, their pre the, the previous rulers of the territories that they find themselves in, or to more mythical ancestors, um, uh, whether religious or, or mythological or, um, or imagined, um, and I feel like we've seen that in uh, in in every case. Um, the textiles are less clearly connected to individual people than a lot of the architectural examples that we've seen, but there still seems to be these kinds of networks of affiliation that you can trace in the textiles as well, which is really an interesting question. Um, another uh, another theme that has come up is. Um, the problem of labels, right? This has come up in every one of these talks. Um, the, the need to differentiate what we're talking about uh, here from the way that they are usually discussed, right? Throwing out uh, late Romanesque <laughs> and, and throwing out Mudejar and, um, and throwing out the attempt to define certain elements of a structure as Islamic or as um, as Fatimid or as, uh, as Christian. Also the problem of uh, associating a style with the religion of the people who may or may not have executed um, that style. These are themes that have come up several times. Um, and we've also uh, been thinking in all of these papers about different kinds of authority, right? Whether it's religious, um, spiritual power, um, uh, royal power, uh, liturgical power, um, and how different kinds of objects can reinforce and authenticate these different kinds of power. Um, we also have been skirting along in some cases and more directly addressing in others the question of artisans and craftsmen um, and uh, their relationship to patrons. And, and one of the things that I'd love to hear you all talk a little bit more about is the question of the agency of the patron or of the craftsman um, and what happens when objects or spaces are um, moved from one place to another, um, how those objects are understood differently, how spaces as they are built and built over again um, are perceived in new ways and how much the people who are viewing the ceremonies and um, political and cultural processes and religious uh, practices that are happening within and inside of these spaces and objects are thinking about them. That is, are these cohesive messages that are understood in a, in a singular way by, by the people who perceive them? Are they, are they messages that shift over time? Um, and these are all, these are all things that I think you have you have raised. So um, that's a very brief set of themes that I hope that we can we can start thinking about and talking about. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite the the people who have given papers to come up and join me at the table, and we will talk about them and also um, uh, open the floor to all of you to ask questions. Unfortunately, Francisco has to leave shortly, so I will ask if anybody have quest has questions for him that we start with those. Just one uh, small question. I, I was completely fascinated by your presentation and completely convinced by your your new reading of uh, everything, but. I just had, uh, I just wasn't sure about one thing that you said when you were talking about that magnificent statue of um, Santiago as the uh, yeah. 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 So did you say if you were able to identify it as such because there was a description of it 
in, what, in, a, in a, one of these documents, I don't know if it was the Col uh, Codex Calistinus or, or another, but I, I just wasn't, I, I don't think I, I uh, remembered or picked up very clearly what were the, the evidence, the textual evidence. So I'm, I'm glad that you, that you asked that question because I can build up a little bit yeah. on the on the question of iconographic identification. Mm -hmm. So um, I mean, you know, when you try to identify a figure without a head, you have to build uh, yes a case <laughs> and discount the possibilities that what the figure cannot be and what is possible that it is right. Mm -hmm. So in the case of the figure, is very interesting because the figure is dressed. Uh, you know, you saw one of the feet is kind of like crossed. That means that the figure is dressed with this dress that also only the knight wear, which is called in Spanish brial endido, mm -hmm. that has an opening so you can right. mount right horses, mm -hmm. right? So on the other hand, uh, in the general <coughs> context of the portal of glory, is wearing a scroll, right? So it's kind of like we are moving between a secular, a secular iconography religious iconography. On the other hand, strikingly, that figure is sitting on a throne. I mean, it's kind of like seated like the prophets in the portal of glory or some of the saints, right? On the other hand, it was very important um, since the foundation of the Order of St. James in 1170 by Fernando II, and this, the creation of what is called the Voto de Santiago, which is a forgery created by the canons of the cathedral regarding the ap apparition of Santiago uh, in, the king, in the clavijo battle, helping the Christians. So according to that, to this forged uh, uh, charter, uh, the rest of basically Spain had to pay some, some some money and some part of whatever they conquered to Santiago. Mm -hmm. So everything was happening there. What was striking is that in the portal of glory, the, or in the facade, there was no representation of St. James as Miles Christi. And also on top of that, it builds with the, the fact that that sculpture, it's, I mean, if you think about the rationale of the sculpture, it's basically a, a knight wrapped around a sword. The sword is the important thing there. And the, the sword, another thing that I forgot, is held with veiled hands. That means that the sword is one of the sacred objects. Like, for example, in the Portal of Glory, the Arma Christi is held with veiled hands by the angels. So that is why I talked about the two dimensions of the sword. The sword as the sword that is the attribute of St. James because of his decapitation and martyrdom and the sword that becomes the attribute of his fight as Miles Christi. So all that together kind of, uh, in my case, convinces me that that is the correct identification. Any other identification would, could be easily contested. So that's, but, but obviously there is no written record. Um, yeah, question for Francisco. Uh, do you see any connection uh, with your uh, first royal capital, with the ascension uh, at Sassana, uh, where Christ has Rex in his halo, and the angels hold him, uh, the two arms up, uh, Sassana, oh, yeah, I, uh, Elijah and Enoch? Uh, yes. Yeah. And so this may relate to a Tonian coronation yeah. ritual, where the king's arms are held up? You know, the Elijah and Enoch in the Portal of Glory is also related to, you know, the famous um, in, in Modena Cathedral and in cathedrals related to it. Elijah and Enoch hold the inscription of Billy Gelbos. And in the Portal of Glory, I didn't talk about it, the jams in space, they are framing the inscription of Master Matthew. And, you know, they are put together there holding that because it's also a way to represent the fame and the glory that the maker of the cathedral would attain because of the uh, Enoch and Elijah. But the, the, I mean... I was thinking more of the uh, holding the arms up as a royal uh, gesture. But in, in which, in which you know, because, I, I mean, you mean the biggest sculptures in the no, jam? No, the first capital of the... Oh, the first, but that yeah. is the first capital? Yes, that is the, the, the ascension to glory of the soul of Alfonso VI, uh, yeah. yes. You know, that capital is, uh, it belongs to a tradition that we can trace to work, to conquer, senat, 
I mean, it's very, there are several like those, but yeah. I'm in the, my Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Junius manuscript before the year 1000. Enoch is shown you know, being carried up to heaven uh, with angels oh, yes. on his side. But the one in the capital you mentioned is not Enoch and Elijah. No, no, I mean, I mean those are two royal angels. Thing, yes, but this yes. holding up of the arm. Yes, yes. Connecting to your royal mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. Itai, then you. Um, thank you very much for your lecture. I, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, following the, the question of, of the gentleman, I mean, you called your lecture Lardus Regiae. Oh. This is a famous book by Kantorovich yeah. which deals with rituals of ascension of Carolingian kings. It relates very well to the Ottonian dynasty. And in light of what uh, Leib talks about, parallel worlds between Roger and, let's say, Suleiman in Iran, I was wondering what would be maybe the Germanic influence in light of the of the church having basically what German architectural historians will call Vesper, right? Yes, so there's yes. a whole tradition that, that relates to Love the Sregue, that relates to Enoch, and that relates to yeah. San Sernin and uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that, uh, I mean, I mean, it would be interesting, for example, to draw um, parallels with, with this and, and other monuments back and forth, the chronological range and geographical range of Europe. As you know, in, in Spanish historiography, the topic of coronations and anointments is kind of very contested. I just don't want to delve into exactly what happened, what it meant, what was happening. It's just a question of analyzing the building. But related to what you, uh, you mentioned, obviously, um, a very interesting place for me to draw parallels that I haven't been able to explore in which everything comes together. The Germanic, the Christian, the Islamic is obviously Sicily. The question with the Norman, Norman monuments in Sicily and the question of coronations, uh, what not in Montreale, and the question also of, of enthronements there, what Lief was saying about the platform. One of the interesting things is that, um, as you know, the daughter of Alfonso VI, one of the daughters, Elvira, was married to Roger II. Then, for example, Ali Drisi, the uh, Roger's uh, geographer, has a huge chapter on the pilgrimage roads to Santiago. Then there is a strong connection between Santiago as a sea and the cult of Santiago and the pilgrimage to Bari. You know, to, and there are connections among those monuments. So I didn't go, for example, aside from what you say, the Germanic perspective, to the Almohad motifs there. But some of those, I mean, you could trace them also to Seville at some point, because Alfonso IX had some alliances with some of the, the kings in Seville. But that, that kind of like merging of imperial traditions from the Holy Roman Empire and uh, merging with Romanesque architecture and with idea of, of kind of sumptuous interiors in, in Easter uh, courts and even Byzantine character, all kind of like merged together in a really interesting way in, um, in, in Norman Sicily. So, you know, uh, I'm, you know, I love to hear like uh, any, any parallel that one can draw, but I mean, you, you, you put yourself in, in such a... Um, when, you, when you do this type of connections um, in, in such a, a difficult situation that I rather analyze what I have in the monument and just bring things that help actually illuminate the characteristics of the monument itself, such as, for example, the, the erogenous uh, point. You know, without drawing direct connections, it's just it frames a little bit the effects and the, the meaning of a space that I wanted to talk about. Thank you. Thank you. When does the association with the show occur? Oh my God, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Very early on, no? Um, Before the sword. <laughs> that, that's why I'm asking. Yeah, yeah, like, absolutely. It was a that's that's very interesting. I should go back to this very good catalog on Santiago. <laughs> I mean, because I, I remember that one of the of the earlier ones that is preserved, an actual you know shell from the pilgrim right. from the 12th century. But uh, yeah, it goes way yeah, way back. It goes way back. Yeah. Did it have to very do with um, the walking stick and the sound that these things would make as they would walk around? That's 
It's also yeah. the myth of the, the story discovery. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. 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 I have to know when is the myth? Come from? Yeah, and the, you know the cult of Saint James has a lot to do with the sea. It's a sea. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. But what does one strike? If I, if I may, I have like two points that uh, I would like to just say for Francisco, and also for uh, Itai's uh, comment is that uh, I think this notion of uh, a two-storied building mm. which ascends itself, uh, uh, that you can see both in the Palatina and uh, in uh, Santiago de Compostela, is something which is, uh, as well known, is related to royal monuments. Mm. Mm. And this has been explored. But also, I recently read Josephus Flavius' description of uh, the Solomonic Temple. Mm. And he says there, explicitly that next to the temple there was a hall which was on the second floor mm. yeah. and this kind of feature that everything has to be elevated together yeah. Yeah. and uh, the second point about the shell so if you look at the shell around the, the lamp yeah. it looks very much it, it, I don't know if it's a shell or it's a rays of, of light it may look both but it does remind you of the of the Cordoba crop mm. in many senses. And this is something which I think one needs to think about these connections. In that case place. it's not a shell, because that, that we have the same platforms in, in some of the of the stalls from the is, is from the choirs. From the, from choir, the choirs, master yes. master. So it's not a it's shell. Not, no, it's the typical it's, yes, it's the it's kind of like a cosmic thing. It's yeah, also an Italian yeah. manuscript. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't the legend say that in times of stress, Santiago rises from the sea with uh, the coquille uh, on his uh, horse? Ah. He's the Matamoros. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. The Before. coquille Saint-Jacques, we shouldn't talk about it this time of day, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, that, you know, he's, the, he's still uh, the general in chief of the Spanish army. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, the Matamoros is, is kind of like, as you see, a later kind yeah. of like development, very late. I mean, but here is not. Yeah, that's a 17th century yes. phenomenon, yes. Yes. right? No, no. To but the shell the, the idea of, of the Julius Christi as an imperial. Yeah. There is also this manuscript, no, with uh, Santiago appearing on. Uh, is it the Calistus? I don't know. Yeah, but this is one of the later copies. But it's the later copy, yeah. Right. yeah. Umberto. Yes, I, I, I want to try to pose um, a general question that maybe will stimulate some uh, discussion uh, about uh, um, patronage and agency in the um, buildings <laughs> and in the <coughs> artifacts that you've shown today. Um, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps explain, uh, in your opinion, what was the degree of awareness of these patrons, the awareness of the very complex eschatological meanings, for instance, of the, of the, the Portal de la Gloria in Santiago de Compostela, or for instance, if this bishop in, uh, uh, in the Aragonese Pyrenees, he knew what the inscription of his scope was saying, or uh, if Roger II was aware of uh, the Suleimanic implications of the of the iconography of his uh, Palatine Chapel. So, to what extent were these uh, patrons also the the interpreters of the hermeneutics of these complex messages, and to what extent they needed support, they needed to be taught what was going on. <laughs> uh, if I can, uh, I mean that for, for what I just said is a, is, a, is a wonderfully essential question because actually the patrons in the case of the Portal of Glory have much to do with the amazing sophistication of what we are looking at. The main bishop is Pedro Suarez de Deza and the second one, the one that consecrated the cathedral is Pedro Muñiz and they both studied in Paris in the context of the, the kind of like uh, popularity of the Victorian school. And as you know, the Victorian school is important because the ephrasis of, of important buildings. One of the best sellers at the time was Richard, was Richard of St. Victor's commentary on the Temple of Ezekiel, 
there are many manuscripts in which, you know, as you know, Richard of San Victor proposed that uh, the temple, the description of the temple could be built. So it's accompanied by architectural plans of how that was built, including one that says how to build the porticos of Ezekiel, uh, which is on a slope exactly like the Santiago Portal of Glory. So these people were like uh, thriving in the knowledge of these architectural elements in biblical text and in, in their exegesis. And what the Portal of Glory does is bring to a materialization, that imaginary architecture. So it has a lot to do. I mean, the, the bishop, the second one that consecrated the cathedral, Pedro Muñiz, was so advanced intellectually in his age that later on in the 14th century, all these legends develop around him that he could fly on a chair, he's, called as the, he, he's, he's known as the necromancer, and that is because they were borderlining into you know, the university system. So it's funny because we think about Santiago as this remote place in the westernmost <laughs> part of Europe, but the people who built the Portal of Glory were the second generation of an actual policy that Helmirez, a generation before, had to send canons to Paris. And Master Matthew is also a, 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 a fruit of that, as an artist, because much of what is happening in the Portal of Glory is taken from developments in the, in, in the Ile de France at that time, you know, with all what that happened a generation earlier in, in Saint-Denis and, and in the Ile de France, mixed with other elements. But yeah, that's essential, and they were totally conscious about it. For uh, yeah no for I think for the for the material culture and especially in Roda in Aragon a Frenchman coming in right um, we really have to question the bilingualism of such an individual <laughs> trilingualism um, we don't know but we don't know what was the really the real extent of bilingualism in Spain in general during the medieval period except for Toledo and, and Valencia and focus like that. Um, but I, you know, here's a good example of I think what was going on. And I'm going to you know, bring back 21st century China again. A Chinese girl with money in a village somewhere doesn't necessarily have to know that Dolce Gabbana are two last names. <laughs> I have my brain the discussion down. Um, to understand the concept of luxury, right, associated with that with that label. Um, in some ways it may have been, and we don't know, speculation, that the ability to incorporate all of these written Arabic in, in this really spectacular way may have had that kind of effect. But there must have been people around able to read that stuff mm -hmm. as well, right? So then you have mediators, Ladinos, right? A category of human who mediated these worlds with the ability to speak multiple languages. Uh, merchants, right? Um, there's any number of in-betweeners in there that could have, you know. But then we have really interesting cases. We have the, the dress in which Berenguela of Castile was buried in the 13th century. This is not just any queen. This is the queen that held Castile together, right, at a very critical time. And she's very wearing this beautiful green gown that when we were reading it, you know, I kept going, like, what is this? Always, always published backwards. You know, the Arabic was backwards. Well, it was woven backwards. When we got to the object, it, you know, and she wore it. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, we photoshopped it and flipped it yep. and read it and that was fine, but she didn't need to, she wore it. Um, so it's all, my, all of this to say we don't really know, but there seems to be any number of currents going on. But, um, what is your um, suggestion about the, the commission of this particular Oh, so, right, thank How you. How was it commissioned? Yeah, the presumption that these are commissioned pieces, um, no. Uh, commission pieces that I can tell you were commission pieces come later, right? So we have beautiful, amazing works where the coats of arms of Castile and Aragon are woven into a cloth, and I can say that is obviously ordered by somebody to be made. Um, because, because that's 
extremely expensive in terms of textile manufacture. If you're going to program a loom to do very little production, programming a loom of that complexity is six months of work, manual. So you, you better get paid up front, and you know you're going to get it. Um, the rest of it seems to be yardage cloth that is no less refined, right? It's just not exclusive or as exclusive. So we make a distinction between the stuff that you go and you say, I need three yards of that, you know, and I make my own stuff and the stuff that, I don't know, the Archbishop of Toledo says, I want my thing to be made according to what I need, you know? So those are two different things. And then there's any number of other ways for this material to come in, right? We know that when uh, cities were besieged there would be encampments, right, surrounding the cities. And in those encampments, <laughs> anything that was looted out of these cities would be exempt from tax payments. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can imagine the amount of illegal activity that, that promoted, right, where you know, people would funnel a lot of goods through the encampment in order to save on taxes. This happens today, right? Um, so there's any number of ways for this stuff to flow um, that that intentionality is hard to, to pin down uh, anyway so. Uh, yeah so you know in terms of um, our knowledge about devising specifically the saving of the Capella Palatina what knowledge do we have of it almost nihil <laughs> <laughs> that that's the main problem. We can be sure though that they didn't study in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> that's one thing. If they did study anywhere, it was either in Bougie or Mahdia <laughs> or Kaira <laughs> One. Yeah. yeah. Well, you're laughing, but these were yeah. important cities, Absolutely. and also <coughs> uh, very well networked centers of commerce. We know to a lot of material comes about about Bougie and these cities. So, candles, regarding candles are called bougie because yeah, of the city of yeah, Bay. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So, regarding Roger, we don't have any evidence whatsoever that he had any interest in either intellectual or uh, well, intellectual. No, he had because he commissioned Andrisi to write his book. <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong with that. <laughs> but <laughs> the thing is, we, I don't believe that you really knew Arabic or stuff like that or I think he left it to the lesser functionaries of his court. We can think about men who were well traveled and had the proper intellectual upbringing to do that. And here we can think about possible candidates. Uh, Eridrisi, first, mo first mostly, uh, but also George of Antioch, who came directly from uh, Zirid, Mahdia, or uh, what was the other capital? I don't remember. Ashir or whatever. Yeah. So he was really brought up in this environment. He may have seen those kind of ceilings with birds, and he must have known, like any basically educated Muslim at this time, about popular tales of prophets. But all this relates again to the programmatic intent, how the things were put down into the Sitting. What do the people uh, think about it? You know, and uh, this brings branches into another question. For example, uh, Philagatus of Cerami, when he sees the ceiling, he says it looks like the stars. I think personally that a Muslim would also recognize the, the stars. So this kind of barri barrier between the Muslim and Christian that we are like, trying to impose, maybe not always existed. Because any ceiling was basically understood as a heavens. So I it's very hard really to come up with any conclusions regarding this kind of agents. I, I better say here not, I don't know, I understand agency is somebody who is immediately between the patron and between the craftsmen who are telling you what to do. So in my mind, it is this milieu of educated eunuchs and uh, court figures like Idrisi and, uh, and George of Antioch who were responsible for that. And what we do know, and this is very interesting, 
is that there are descriptions, which are later, that talk about all this world of uh, minor courtiers and eunuchs who serve at Roger's court. And when Ibn Jubair comes there, the first thing uh, they ask him he is, how are things in Mecca? How was the pilgrimage this year? Uh, or there's another figure also that says, so, yeah, he was kind of plotting with the al -Muhad. So we have this kind of <laughs> evidence that the intellectual networks were or working and on. So these people probably devised the intellectual makeup of the city. Um, unfortunately, we're going to have to say goodbye to Francisco, who has to leave. Um, but we will continue, we'll continue the, the conversation um, after he leaves. Thank it's you. for a good cause. I mean, <laughs> one, one of my best friends uh, is getting married. So <laughs> <laughs> silk wrapped in gold work and stick is a very fine layer of sheep gut, right? Mm -hmm. To which you adhere a very, very thin layer of gold that you then spin around uh, what we call the, the soul, right? The alm of the, of the, of the soul. Um, and there's a lot of debate around it. This is usually called Oro de Chipre, Cypriot gold. Um, we're trying to understand how, right, if, if, if this is something that came already made and was imported, exported. Uh, there must have been, obviously, a production in Spain yeah. itself. Um, we are trying to see whether we can ascertain biologically what kind of sheep this was, right? You can do DNA analysis, but we need to raise a lot of funds for that. So the, the, this is in our future. <laughs> um, but, but we know that, that leather work in Andalus was incredibly advanced, and it was through the 16th, 17th century, right, that um, a uh, big part of exports was Cordoban, what we call Cordoban, or, or very finely finished um, leathers, um, in particular as it relates to textiles, it seems to have been a hyper-specialized production. I don't know if that helps, but it's all I <laughs> What about also wall covering? They wall coverings? Oh, yeah. Um, we, we know from descriptions, right, that um, the walls of any, well, any of these palaces, actually, and cathedrals, would have had a seasonal component to them, but in the, <laughs> in the Summer it would have had very thin silks and cottons maybe, and in the winter it would have had wools and leathers in particular to keep the moisture and the, and the cold away, that, that the, the floors would have been covered in carpets for the same reason. In the summer probably more breathing maybe or elevating so that it could breathe a little bit more. So there was a, a definite seasonal component. We don't have very much knowledge outside of the Nasrid world for that kind of decorative, you know. So we have these big Nasrid curtains and what we, and wall coverings because of just how thick or how. How far back is that? This is 14th okay. centuries when we really have this kind of explosion of decorative wall covering that has survived to our day. Uh, but we do have very large, uh, two meter lengths of very fine silk that would have hung as altar cloth frontals. Um, on the Eucharistic table all over Spain, especially in, in Catalonia, huge, huge tradition of that, covering panel painting, protecting it, and covering it until the <coughs> time of the liturgical, right, liturgical time of the year to reveal it. Um, other than that, we don't have much more. Iman? Um, for the left, uh, I'm very happy that you showed those um, 10th and 11th century some 10th and 11th century Fatimid panels, and I'm wondering how much you thought about Cairo, because those of us who do work on Cairo 
work from an obvious disadvantage. I mean, we have these remains, tangible remains, from both the Eastern and Western Fatimid palaces, but we have very little context for them because of the way that they were reused in the Ayyubid and the Mamluk period, but then subsequently how they were discovered by the Comité a hundred years ago. I mean, the Comité left no record for where in Qalamun and Nasr Muhammad and in Balkuk and in Salih Nekmiddin Ayyub, they left, no con they left no description or record for where exactly these panels were found. So for, I mean, if you've given us something to think about because of the parallel imagery that you explained, you know, there are a lot of parallels, but we can't do the same type of reconstruction. Or I'm wondering, I don't know. That's, that's funny that you, you should be asking this because I just uh, told about something, an idea about that. How? Y you mean the long panels, well, not the ones that are in situ still in Kalaun, but the longer panels that are now uh, showcased in the... I think all of them, because even no, the that, that are groups. in situ were not yeah, necessarily no, no, that's but not that's, original location. Let's, sti let's stick to the groups, because... There are panels which are obviously coffers, and mm -hmm. you can see that they are coffers. I'm not talking about this because it's quite obvious that they were just coffers on the city. But the more famous ones, which are always, you know, textbook in uh, works on Islamic art, are the ones with the longer planks. Mm -hmm. I think personally, and this makes sense if you look at Coptic monuments, that they were positioned somewhere next to the ceiling in the uh, you know, like between the ceiling and at the top of the wall. This is the most logical place. There, they would probably also not be seen, you know, which is another interesting point, but it's a kind of, I think this is the most logical uh, reconstruction of them. Because I don't see any other, well, they may have been a freeze on the wall, but I think this is the, the most uh, logical position. But it's speculation. I'm sorry. Um, you said um, the distance between the floor yes. and this uh, uh, ceiling yes. is about 13 meters. 13 meters. So it's uh, for normal air, it's uh, hardly visible. Uh, the, the, the whole this program, which has been depicted, and um, I thought about that. Uh, that uh, the whole program is aligned in the level of uh, project design, uh, no, known only for those people who designed and created this ceiling. And the people who, uh, I mean, uh, uh, contemporary people or people who are uh, seeing this uh, ceiling till now, they don't recognize this program. I mean, uh, there is a discrepancy between the scholarly uh, discussions of the meaning of these uh, depicted images and uh, what we see in reality. <coughs> This is actually uh, this is such a question for ev for all. Yes, of the it's a good question. The question know, the there is a good article visible. which actually deals with it. Well, kind it's of. it's one, and the second uh, uh, remark yes. is. Uh, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm actually out of the Islamic time. Um, you showed two, uh, you interpreted two images of the kings as the two Suleimans. Yes. And I noticed for me uh, that uh, uh, one image is, uh, um, how to say it, it's, uh, from both sides of this image uh, are standing uh, two uh, men. Uh, in headbands, and yes. on the second image, uh, they are in hollows. Yes. So it means for me, uh, as a, li a, lay, a lay woman, yeah, um, one image is in the Christian uh, world, um, uh, or, or depicts Christian world, and the second one, uh, Oriental, or I don't know, Middle East. Yeah? So, uh, how you, uh, I don't know how to say it, 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 can, it cannot be 
um, displayed as an image of one person. So let me uh, start with your second question. And the second, and the third. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm afraid we're, we're running. We're running very short on time. We're far over where we're supposed to be. So um, we really, okay. we really need to, to wrap up. So uh, I'll do it quick. I thought I'd do it quickly. First of all, hello. In Islamic art, just uh, a note. In Islamic manuscripts, hellos are just uh, how would you say it? Uh, they don't mean anything basically because even attendants and very like com the commonest people sometimes ha have hellos. Why they do have that's not a question, we don't really know why. But it was a kind of a, um, I forget what's the word, the, the cliche or something. Whatever. <laughs> so it doesn't mean anything. What it does, the other thing, the band is usually considered a female. A female he headgear because of certain textual uh, sources. But your more interesting question is actually about visibility, which always comes up. Now, the thing is, how much can we see of the great Dacian War of Trajan on the colon of Trajan? <laughs> Almost nothing. How much can we see of the Olympic Games on the Pantheon? Very little. How ca much can we see of you know these great Olympics that uh, where they have big big tribunes with uh, dancers or whatever they do in uh, Rio? Yeah, we don't see much of it. It's another question. How it performed? It's it's a different thing, and th I don't see here a problem. Another, just one last thing is that some of the images, it's not true that uh, nothing can be recognized. Because when you, there were chandeliers, but the hooks are still there. Yeah, and with the chandeliers, you can see the larger images. Now, you cannot see the details, but you can see that there's a lion and a man. Or you can see there's a big bird. That's all you can see, and that you're right. <laughs> Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to break for coffee, otherwise we won't have any time at all. Um, so please come back in 15 minutes uh, for our panel this afternoon. We will have a few